Hello and good morning. Uh, hope everyone's doing well today. I know it is early. I appreciate you being here. Um, I learned it also might mean you bought a fancy ticket, so congratulations on that. Um, yeah, so we are here from Bitwig. What we have, uh, what happens to be new in Bitwig in version three is this thing called the grid. So what we'll be talking about today, um, we're using the grid as the tool to look at some different kinds of techniques, some different modular techniques, some different ways of approaching things. And what's always really at the heart of modularity, which is if you understand the function that's going on, um, then you can make whatever you want. Then you can use a module for a completely non-traditional purpose. Uh, and maybe it'll still make some sense if you understand the signal flow of what's going on. Please find a seat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure people will generously scoot over. Um, so yeah, that's the general thrust of it. Um, I'm thinking of all this in kind of three sections. One, which is a little bit of just understanding the grid and looking at it so that we've got a, enough of a common vocabulary to then jump in to a couple different concept idea, concept examinations to look at how a few different um, a few different things work individually in any modular system. Um, we, I, this is just a good place to show a lot of ideas because ideas are always more interesting than the particular tool that you're using for my money. Um, and then towards the end, I'd like to show two or three simple examples of taking some of those different concepts and combining them um, for a musical purpose. So just a bit of what's going on here, what we're talking about, and then digging in further um, to some concepts. So uh, the first question, the nice obvious question would be, what is the grid? <laughs> what is this thing that we're looking at? Uh, I would divide it up into, it's kind of two pieces. Uh, one piece is the library of modules, because if you don't have modules, you can't put anything uh, together. So I could zoom in a little bit here. They're categorized, trying to be uh, useful. It's, wow. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Hey, we're going to do better next time. It's fine. <laughs> um, but they're, they're categorized in a way that makes sense once you start using it. So I.O. is just anything that you can pull in and out of the system, and we'll dig more into that a little bit later. Uh, oscillator, okay, pretty predictable, sure. You've got some uh, standard issue shapes there with some interesting controls on them. Uh, as you might notice, and we'll look at, there's a whole bunch of parameters kind of baked in there in a little way, but it's the same on all of them. So you learn it once, it becomes consistent. Um, beyond that, in that category, we've got a couple uh, fun guys, kind of a unison stack oscillator in this other uh, Cutely named Phase One. Uh, last year we were talking. Yeah, last was it last year? Wow, yeah. we were talking about a uh, Phase Four, which is a synthesizer we have. So one of these oscillators is particularly <laughs> focusing on like one of those units of phase distortion. Go to town. Um, and if you if you prefer entire huge devices built into a single place, well, that's our enormous crazy sampler from the last update basically in module format. So yes, you have a multi-sample with 100 uh, wave files. Drop it in here. It'll run. It's just a module now. Good luck. Um, but it has all of the wavetable modes, the uh, granular modes, and everything else. So oscillators is normally a place to start. So we just kind of go through that a little bit. But we'll skip through these quickly. Uh, random, uh, random sample and hold type LFO with some noise and other uh, whether you want a random chance that something will happen. Oh, 25% of the time, give me a trigger to actually make something happen. Um, or just give me a random value altogether, because I like to mix it up and I'm tired of my cutoff being static. Uh, some LFO things for any low, slow-moving type signals, uh, whether it's a clock in hertz or a transport sync to the DAW, because we are the DAW, so that's easy. Um, number of envelope generators. Filters like you'd kind of expect. Wave shapers, which are interesting, and we'll take a look at. 
just different ways of reshaping your wave in a linear or nonlinear way. Uh, some delays and things that go all over the place. Uh, an all pass filter configured as a delay, so you've got delay time and feedback percent on it, uh, and even a recorder module, so that anything that comes in, you can say when you want to grab it and put it back out. Um, and just because we're not going to like see that example particularly, when I say once you understand what a what modules are and how they function, then that's when you're really free, because if you took something like the recorder. Yeah, that's a fine way to put in some audio phrase and sample it and have it re-trigger whenever you want. But why does it need to be an audio phrase? Uh, audio phrase. Maybe you're putting a random sequence into it and now you can play it back and it's not random anymore. Maybe you're taking envelope signals and recording them and doing something with it. Um, there's absolutely no reason that any of this has to be used for audio. That's where it's fun. Uh, mix is interesting because it's really mixing and signal routing. So yes, uh, I've got a mixer that can expand up to six channels because when you need more channels, it's nicer if someone just gives them to you. Um, or maybe I just want to mix two signals in a crossfader. So a, bl a blend module. Yeah, we're seeing gestures already. We'll, we'll dig into that pretty soon. Um, or ways of merging and splitting one signal into up to eight different destinations, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Yes, like a lot of other stuff in Bitwig, you could strip something out and say, oh, well, make it left, right, or make it mid-side. Or both at the same time if you want really odd math. Um, so there's a lot of ways to work with things in there. And then the lower, the lower column is kind of... Sometimes interesting, but always necessary. <laughs> Meaning level, pitch, math, and logic. Okay, what are we talking about level? Well, you're just dealing with things in the amplitude domain and affecting it. So some of these are more clear than others. Sure, a clipper where I can set a particular level and it's just gonna cut everything off at that point. Or I wanna, sometimes I wanna scale by percentage with like an attenuator, just say how much signal, but sometimes I'd rather do that in decibels. And sometimes that's configured to an audio range, like minus infinity to plus six or plus 12. Maybe I just want linear, minus 24 to plus 24. There's enough different ways um, that you have to deal with things. The point I'm trying to make here is all of these on their own terms are fairly understandable. Not too many of these modules are huge and complex because in the end, it's your job to make something bigger or huge and complex or whatever. Modules need to be building blocks that work. They need to function predictably and easily, and sometimes they need to be boring so that you can do the interesting thing on top instead of one little module being like a dazzling. That's not, that's not what we're going for. Um, interestingly, let's just throw that one in for fun. The AMRM, ooh, excuse me. The AMRM module that's just letting you crossfade between, oh, just give me the carrier coming in for display purposes, I have a second signal. Or I want, at 50%, classic amplitude modulation, so it's working like a classic VCA altogether, but we faded our way there. Or fading up from amplitude modulation to ring modulation. Some people call it balanced amplitude modulation. But once you have those positions in between, you have a lot more sound design possibilities. So a whole bunch of ways to deal with level, whether it's sample and hold, or simply hold. <laughs> which is a little different. Uh, the pitch guys are fun. We'll look at uh, a few of these specifically, um, so we'll come back to that. Yeah, you gotta have math. Nobody gets scared. Sometimes people get scared. There's no reason to be scared. Okay, be just a little scared, maybe. Um, straightforward stuff. Uh, bigger functions, if you're trying to build a particular algorithm in, it's just nicer that someone gives you a floor algorithm sometimes, or a ceiling, or a round, so that I can set a relationship and already have that there instead of taking five modules to make that relationship. Um, these are fun. Sometimes you have a bunch of control signals you want to go somewhere. And like Mixer, sometimes that means you just need a lot more inputs that you just want to add all of them together. So, there will be more inputs. Uh, some other unit converters and that sort of thing. 
And then finally, the good stuff, logic. Are these signals equal? Is this greater or equal to that one? What is the exclusive or relationship between the two signals coming in? Uh, will we use a couple of these today? Yeah, why not? They become necessary. And then on top of that, some other simple for logic signals to just define the length of a pulse coming out of it or to set up a repeating uh, gate signal over and over and over again. So almost a binary oscillator, I suppose. So that's a little bit of rundown of what the modules are. Um, but the other part of what the grid is, is really, is really the gestures of making this what I would describe as, I mean, it's a modular environment. I would describe it as a modular sound design environment. You know, the whole point is that you can get audio, you can get sound, you can work with things quickly, uh, and that you're focusing on making an interesting sound instead of trying to reconfigure the module system to make sure you have audio coming out. Um, you know, there's a lot of systems out there. Some of them you make things completely manually. Some of them help you a little bit more. Um, I guess the simple way I would say it is I would prefer a system that lets me focus on sound instead of feels like I'm doing my taxes and have to like make sure all the right boxes are checked and that this thing's turned on and oh, where did, the, oh, audio's going to the wrong port. Okay, whatever. Um, so we've tried to work around that. So let's take a look at that and I'm gonna do that by going ahead and starting with a simple polygrid patch. Um, so the simple patch out of the box, aha, is exceptionally simple. But it makes sound already. And that's strange because there's only two patch chords going on and suddenly I'm getting articulated sound which I can control. Um, a small mention on why this is so simple, and then after we cover a couple other topics, we'll explode this briefly. Uh, part of the reason it's simple is, most of the time when you insert an envelope generator, you would like the keyboard to trigger the envelope generator. Most of the time. So this little icon sitting here is actually what we call a pre-chord. It's a patch chord that's already in place, it's been done wirelessly, so you don't have to look at a patch where every single envelope generator has something coming from keyboard gate to go across it. If I disable this, sure, the keyboard is no longer having any effect, so you can do anything you want. You can still use the port there for some other signal, or you just turn off this normal. So it saves some visual clutter on that. Similarly, the Oscillator is tracking the pitch of the keyboard because, yes, there's a pre-chord. Now it's gray. So we're trying to make this, first of all, if I drop in one of these modules, it's connected in the way you want most of the time. <laughs> I'm not trying to guess what everyone wants to do with the system, you know? Um, it's, it's there and it's totally open for you. So. Those pre-chords are there, that's one thing. And then, again, these are straightforward sounds, but we've tried to throw into anything wherever possible, uh, simple but somewhat unique or different ways of manipulating the sound to get something interesting and different. So, it's a little loud. If it's ever a little too painful and loud or needs a little more zooming in, just yell at me. trying to make my triangle wave into an English horn, but there you go. Um, so there are these parameters built in there that are not what you would typically expect. I mean, normally it's just, oh, give me a triangle or kink it a little bit or something. But we've tried to put something in there so that you can quickly get to a sound change. Now, as far as where the quick part comes into play, let's start talking about gestures. I have this oscillator here. Whee! It's a triangle wave. Maybe I want to try something else. So if I were to take the pulse wave and drop it on top of the triangle wave, 
Notice where the parameters are that I have changed. Okay. They are preserved. Because it knows it's another oscillator. It's been set up to say, oh, these are fairly complementary parameters. So keep things where I had them. And yes, the cables are already in place and anything that you've done internally is already there. So up? Okay. Well, no, I, I'll turn it down a different way. We'll go to sign. A little more. Okay. Again, that's not a particularly uh, orthodox sine wave, but... Now, if I decide I want to insert some more modules, maybe it's time to play with shapers. One thing that's interesting is, uh, and again, it's a workflow deal, I can drag this where I want in the chain, and, oh, you're dropping it on a port. There already happens to be a cable there. Maybe you want us to help you out with that. I'm just gonna hold a note. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm going to keep holding the note for two more seconds. That is a very resonant fellow there. So, uh, yeah, you drop something in here. Oh, we can sense that there's chords running through here of a certain type. We probably should reconnect them and keep them going. And, oh, you don't even have to play another note. The sound's just going to keep going, so you can keep tweaking sound. Um, maybe instead of a static distortion sound, I want the distortion to come after the, the amplitude shaping that the envelope and its uh, amplifier are doing. So maybe I should reorder it. Things can be dragged around easily. Maybe it's time for some other crazy nonsense. <laughs> Fun, but it's too much for what I want right now. I will simply select and delete, and of course, why wouldn't you just reconnect the chord? Because now, um, I'm pretty sure I haven't drawn a patch chord yet while we've been standing here. So just a different way of, of approaching the system. So when you see me do these things quickly, the, as we start looking at concepts, that's what's going on. It's handling a lot of this work for you because you are already suggesting what you want. We're just trying to pick up the ball and say, okay, let's connect it for you, make it easy and fast, and uh, keep going. Now, that is, that's a... a a decent overview of some of the simple stuff of what's going on. I would say, um, I don't know about you, whenever you're, I'm in a new system, what I try to do immediately is try to understand what are these signals, what are the levels, how are they thinking about this, what does a pitch signal really mean, what does zero represent, that sort of thing. So if we take a moment, we do have uh, an oscilloscope. So if we were to take, let's say the, so now we can see the envelope of the signal. Why does it look funny? Because it's tracking the pitch I'm playing on the keyboard, but I transposed it down two octaves. That's a little prettier. <laughs> or maybe instead of looking at it that way, I just want to see the actual waveform being multiplied with the original waveform instead of the signal itself. Now, 
Now, that is all well and good. That might be what you expect. But a little bit more of features we're going to use as we go. There is an inspector panel in here. And if I do call up the inspector panel and select a module, such as the AR over here, it does conveniently automatically scope every signal that's currently coming into the system and going out of the system. So having all of those there, just at a glance, I can select a module, and I'm not, I'm, not working, I'm not spending time debugging all of this and saying, oh, but is the keyboard signal actually getting into there to trigger it, or is something happening along the way? No, I can just see right off the bat. Yes. I see my gate signal off the keyboard triggering the envelope. I see the envelope shape coming down at the output. I see the original signal in, and then I see the multiplied version of the signal where the envelope is controlling the amplitude of that output. So the fact that all these scopes are here can be awfully handy. So let's just spend a brief moment, and we'll get into some of these in more detail as we look at concepts. but. Um, what are the different color codings going on? What's happening? So we're looking at AR. He's got a yellow input port for gate. And when we were looking just briefly over all these logic modules, there's a lot of yellow stuff over here. Yellow's a logic signal, meaning it's high logic or low logic. It's going to be off or on. Is the keyboard gate being triggered? Yes or no. You could think of it as true or false. Signal-wise, it's one or zero. Uh, internally, it's is it greater, is it at or greater than 0.5 or not? So, yellow is for logic signals, uh, like we had over here. Uh, just glancing briefly, if we were to look at our sign oscillator, we've got actually one of each type. And we'll cover these more, but I just want to say them now. Uh, purple is a phase input, so it's letting you control the phase of the module, whatever it is. Uh, in, in our world, phase is a signal going from 0 to almost 1. Um, and it's usually a signal used to, in the case of an oscillator, drive through the waveform at a certain at a certain speed or to change its current position. Um, orange is pitch, which is why we have this whole big row at the bottom of different ways to control the pitch or frequency of every oscillator. Um, so pitch in Bitwig land is essentially every 0.1 value is an octave. So if you take a regular signal from minus one to one, that's 20 octaves worth. So we're just dividing it up and using the even places in between or the places in the middle, any of the micro pitch, pitches in there, to control the pitch. For everything else, these are this turquoise color because that's just the default color for control modules. If I did decide I wanted to change the color of this module, then those port colors are going to follow as well. It's just a signal port. There's, there's no particular rhyme or reason to it. Uh, it doesn't have a perfectly prescribed range. It doesn't have a usage until you connect it to one of those other ports or an audio output. So we're just doing signal processing. And then occasionally you'll see blue when there's multiple output ports of different types. So here. Signal output for the envelope generator, and then the actual envelope signal underneath if you want to use it as a control. That's a little bit on that. And then just a brief moment on saying, once you're in here, um, you know, where's the manual? What, what do all these little knobs do? I'm noticing some weird things in the inspector over here. What do they do? Well, there's a nice show help button or the F1 key, which will take that module that you're using and actually blows it up in, this is the actual module within the patch. It's just a different way of looking at it with full details on the parameters and their ranges, the attenuators and their ranges, the different inputs and outputs, what functions are going on. Uh, and it also highlights whatever's in the inspector because sometimes you're just working and you don't see those extra settings over there, so it's a nice reminder that these things are here. Oh, I can actually change the slope of the on. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Oh, and I see now up at top, there's that little dot moving. So, oh, okay. Somebody was tricky and snuck in a tiny little dot so that you could have a control on the top level. It's just a nice reminder of any of these things because you don't 
you don't want to have to remember them all the time. And then whatever you select, if I just arrow around the patch and hit F4, or F1, F1, F4, um, I end up back here. Sometimes when the parameter is a little strange, like setting a ratio for an oscillator to adjust its frequency, there'll be some examples, etc. But again, this is exactly the live pat, the uh, live module inside of the patch. So just a focused way of getting more information as we go around. Now the last thing, the last thing I would say in general about the system, we saw it a moment ago when I pulled this up. There are two grid devices. The one that we've been using is called Polygrid. He's thinking in an instrument type configuration. So his primary assumption is that notes are going to come in, and then we're going to do something with it and trigger audio. Doesn't mean you have to have notes coming in. You could just delete that envelope and you're going to have a droning patch. You just won't hear me talk very well once we do that. Um, you could do drones that way. You could do something that's based on step sequencers and it's just automatically triggering itself. Uh, you could do anything you wanted. Effects grid is aimed, and you can kind of see by the default here. Oh, what does that look like? Well, audio input, audio output. What goes in the middle? It's up to you. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't care. Make something interesting. <laughs> Please don't blow up your ears. Um, so effects grid is oriented towards letting you take and process audio. But the one thing I would mention, and like I said, we were going <laughs> to revisit this category for a moment. This is the effects grid, and this is the I.O. category. So, yes, gate and pitch of incoming notes. Well, which notes are those? Oh, you can define over here a separate source of notes on a different track to read completely. In so, yes, can you connect both worlds? Can effects grid listen to notes and other information like that? Yes. Can uh, polygrid take audio sources from other places? by sidechain or by external input, or yes, by CV in or out. Yeah, all of those are in here already. Since we're at Superbooth, yes. Some nice little one-by-one -one modules that show you, oh, I'm bringing a CV in signal. Maybe you need a couple extra settings for that. Where is it coming off your interface? Is it AC or DC? Do you want to apply a little gain or a little bit of filtering on the way in? Sure. Oh, an output. Yes, AC or DC filtering, averaging on it. Or to configure pitch range. Yeah. So it's a little outside the scope. I did not bring in a little module unit. But at this point, <laughs> those little one-by-one -one objects in here bring your signal back and forth so that now hardware plus grid equals one system. It's kind of a nice way to work. If you go by the booth later, you, you, we've got some stuff set up. You could play with it. Uh, so yeah. Now, before we get into the concepts, I just want to revisit one thing. Because now that we have some ideas of what's going on there, let me just make it a little bit more literal. This is the default patch. And I told you the reason we're getting away with only two patch chords is because, well, there's all these pre-chords and other things going on, and... Okay, let's literally make this patch if you didn't have those simple things on it already. Okay, gate in device, gotta connect him manually, turn off the pre-chord. Pitch in, so the oscillator will track the pitch, connect it, open the attenuator all the way so it's mapping pitch correctly. So I'm kind of making the same patch now. Uh, you notice, of course, now I've used up both of those input ports. So maybe I want to be able to still use them. That would mean I probably need to add this with another port. And oh, I had an attenuator over there. So that probably means I should have... Oh. I skipped ahead. I should go ahead and add a level control and then multiply by that level control. Okay, now that's my... Oh, we can be so helpful. I will make it orange, as that is my new pitch input. 
So this is kind of what's already in the system to begin with. How do I get an extra port over there? Well, that would mean I probably want to do a, a logic relationship that either signal coming in will happen to trigger it. Now there's my second one. But then I look here and I realize, oh, but I had these nice little switches where I could just turn that signal off and on, and right now they're on all the time. Okay, maybe I'm going to go to the level category. Remember, uh, excuse me, the mix category for signal routing. Oh, a toggle. I can now turn signals. And this is partly just to get an appreciation of what's going on in all of its different dimensions, but also these modules, I mean, it's in something called mix. Most people out of the box are gonna go, oh, audio, no. No, you have a signal going through, you wanna turn it off? Cool, this is your guy. Uh, you have an OR relationship? Yeah, that's for your keyboard gate signals, why not? Um, we haven't even <laughs> talked about the fact that you've got an auto retrigger pre-cord on there. So I can go ahead and throw him over there, put it here, he was off by default. He was yellow. Uh, oh, and by the way, do envelope generators have signal inputs? No, sorry, P Professor had for two seconds. You cannot run a signal through an envelope generator, so this obviously has, a fil uh, has an amplifier attached to it. So what are we actually doing? Well, this is the actual signal path of what's going on. I'm just double-clicking and moving cables, so... I am generating an envelope signal and then using it as a multiplier. Okay, this is a lot closer to what that simple patch was to begin with if we had to make it all each time. So just an appreciation of yes, everything's of a different type and you can use it for whatever purpose you want. And also, um, the focus is on quickness and sound design. You know, you can still undo all those things. You don't lose a lot by not making it this way. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting sentence. So, we've got some different ways to control this, and I'm just gonna leave that over there for a moment. And we can start looking at some concepts. Maybe I'll come back to this punch. Uh, that whole octave there, there we go, that's much prettier. I have a friend who informs me that plugins should be judged solely on their appearance. I mean, I'm guessing everyone has someone like that in their lives. That's what the waveform is reminding me of. Okay, so to some of these additional concepts that are are uh, that we can explore now, um, one is the idea the idea of stereo. So something I haven't mentioned yet about this system in particular, or just the way you work half of the time oh, I've got this whole thing, and now maybe I want to duplicate the whole chain and make it a little bit different for the left and different for the right. Uh, a nice feature of the grid is that every patch cord you see here, every signal going around, is actually uh, two things. One, it is stereo. And two, it is four times your currently set sample rate. So, yes, if you have your system running at 96K, then that's... 380. I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> but everything inside of the grid is running at four times that, not just because, oh, now the output quality is so much better, it obviously gets downsampled, but if you're doing modulation relationships and other things, you alias a lot quicker than when you just get to the sample rate Nyquist. So it needs that to do the extra math and have, have well, the best possible sound quality. Um, the nice thing about that is the way we've made it, it basically takes the same processing as if you were running one signal through it, we're just running eight. Because when you open up the grid, it looks at your processor, figures out what it is, and says, oh, let's compile things to do math exactly the way this guy will in an optimized fashion. So that's the non-rocket science version of it runs lots of signals real fast. Um, but that also means if every cable is stereo, it would be nice to have some easy ways to manipulate things in stereo. So for example, if I come back over to the sine wave guy, who again is not, not a very well-behaved sine wave, 
Uh, I have this frequency control here. So if I just pull it up, it's doing what you think. Oh! I just kind of feel out of tune, or bloated, or something. Um, but a little hint to the user there, why do you need a bipolar signal that's showing you positive and negative? Oh, because it's a clickable button. Because sometimes you want the left channel and the right channel to be opposite. And now, thanks to our wide stereo field in here, uh, you can hear that, yes, there's a way to directly affect the channels independently straight from the front of the module. So, it's a nice, quick, and easy way to do that. If um, a lot of our modules are made to think in that way because we support stereo directly, so there's a way to easily work with stereo. Let's try a different example for a second. I'll leave all this stuff here. Let's just add some kind of like a tremolo effect. Like, I'm gonna throw in uh, just a multiplier at the end of the signal chain. I'm getting no sound because time zero is no sound. Good, hey, don't do that. And then if I pull in an LFO module, So, LFO is kind of fun and interesting. I have a variety of wave shapes here that I can choose from, and one unified control for saying skew it a little differently. I like this guy, we'll come back to this guy. Okay, a little sharp. If it's too quick of a transition, then the level category will probably help me out. Maybe I throw a little lag in here to say slow down that signal so it's not such an abrupt transition. Now, charmingly on top of all this, I've got two phase controls. What? One, which will nicely be visualized of what is the position of the waveform itself. And two, remember every signal is stereo. This is an offset amount for the right channel only. If only there was a way to visualize that. There we go. Lots of ways to make a simple fake stereo image now. <laughs> yeah, 180 degrees, why not? Oh yeah, I'm the DAW. Good. Let's just set it to quarter notes instead of some weird Hertz thing. Bipolar, yeah, that'll work. So, Stereo is baked into these things, whether it's the front panel of all the oscillators or the front panel of the LFOs, uh, with an easy, quick way to start adjusting things in that domain and make them more interesting. Now, this is a control signal. When I say all signals are stereo, it's not just audio signals. It's every signal. So, I got my sine wave. I've got a constant in the pitch category, which just says, I'm going to set a number, but I want to set it based on like a semitone. So, let's open this up. Okay. Just another way of setting a value. Now, a lot of our constant generators have a nice little function over here called stereoize. What? <laughs> what does that mean? Now, pitch is kind of the weirdest one to think about, but C3 is our zero, okay? That's why I'm gonna hear the same thing if I disconnect this as when it's connected. So if I click stereoize, 
it's going to fold around zero. So now, uh, if whatever the, the value here is will be used for the left side, and the opposite around C3 will be used for the left side. Fun question. I turned off keyboard tracking. Why, why is my sound changing? Well, ow, because my filter has a nice little keyboard tracking control as well because pre chords are all over the place and life's easier that way. Okay. And again, I mean, if you can use a module for a non traditional purpose, how about use a keyboard interface for a non traditional purpose? It leads to different, more interesting <laughs> results. Uh, before we look at phase, remember this guy? We left out stereo. <laughs> okay. Let's see how the copy logic does here. Let's go for that. Just one talk. Oh, I, that was my mistake. Just one toggle. One attenuator. Okay. There we go. That's pretty good. Duplicate everything. Maybe we go over here, say we're going to use this as the left channel, this is the right channel. Okay. That's a little bit better. So, yeah, that default patch of three modules and two chords is kind of this if you start looking at it and thinking about what's going on. Um, again, the focus doesn't have to be uncomplicated. It can just be on, let me get some sound out of it. So... That's kind of fun. Now, let's talk. Keep this. Okay. So this idea of phase is interesting. If you're used to traditional, uh, the traditional way that a lot of modular things, whether it's a step sequencer or whatever, thinks about position and advancing is it's usually a trigger signal coming in saying, okay, now I go to the next step, one of these gate signals we were talking about. Next step, next step, next step. Um, since we live in this place that has the potential to be sample accurate, why not make it sample accurate? Uh, and why not make it easy? So we focused a whole lot on phase as a concept altogether. Now, like I said a minute ago, it's a signal between zero and one. And if I were to drag a step sequencer in, you will see, let me pick a starker color. Maybe that's a little easier to read. Uh, why is this already moving? Oh, pre-chord. Okay. <laughs> There's a pre-chord. You throw it in, it's already going to be in motion. Uh, what speed is it moving at? Well, that's the current tempo of the session. So out of the box, you insert any of these step sequencers, any of the sequencer modules under the data category, and it is automatically syncing exactly to a one bar time span. Can you change that? Of course. The device itself happens to have a setting over here that says, oh, I would like to last for 16 sixteenth notes. Yeah, that's, that's a bar. Maybe I only want eight sixteenth notes. That would make it twice as fast. Okay, now it's going twice as fast and cycling through twice per bar. Oh, I did not mean to go to 99. Okay. 16 sixteenth notes is sufficient. So on the simplest level, this idea of phase lets you keep things synchronized in a to the moment, to the point kind of way. So a step sequencer is a decent example for that. Why don't we go ahead and connect it? Okay. <laughs> We've had enough uh, pitch fun there. So now the step sequencer is going into the you can see down maybe at the very bottom of the screen the cutoff input of the filter. So if I open the attenuator. Or maybe I want it bipolar. And 
And I want to say, make every other step the opposite. Why not? Okay. So, I've got my step sequence to there. I've got my signal going out of that. Now, like anything, what's interesting is actually affecting the signals instead of just letting them go through. So the default is saying one bar perfectly synced phase ramp, but until we have that phase ramp, we can't really manipulate it in an interesting way. So I'm going to go ahead and under the LFO, slow moving category, transport, who looks a great deal like the device phase settings that I had a minute ago. Oh, 16th, 16th notes, and maybe an offset, so it starts three 16th notes back or forwards. Oh, and 16th, 16th notes. Okay. So I've got the signal generator. It's just nice to not have to add him every single time I drop a sequencer in. So if I turn this off, no pre-chord, no motion. Hey. Exactly what was happening a moment ago. Now, once you, once you understand what the phase signal is, there's different ways to alter it and be interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this step sequencer for a moment, just so we have a reference point, right? Duplicate kept the incoming connection. So now I can see the bottom one moving in a linear way, and I can play with how the top one works. Um, there is an entire category called phase. <laughs> yes, it is interesting. So if I go ahead and grab, let's say, this bend module, and I'm going to drop it on the input port here, because I don't want it to, if I dropped it on the output port, it would have, it would have reconnected to both modules. But by putting it here, I'm only affecting the one up top. So now, if I were to click. Still perfectly in sync, like you see. I mean, you've probably played this game before, but the interesting thing about irregular rhythms is if they happen regularly, they become regular. <laughs> All right, I got a bend going on. Maybe I want to do something a little different or crazier. Oh, mirror. Okay, that sounds fun. So if I bring this level up, it's, you can even see in the hint here, Oh, I'm going to go through the read phase and then kind of come back a little at the end and then start over. <laughs> so even if these two were running, I mean, a lot of the time coming from a common clock is the, the best way to put something together if you want them vaguely synchronized and then you can make a mess on the way on some of the signal chains and something interesting will come out of it. Um, and maybe the simplest but most practical example, phase reset. Why, what? What's this guy going to do? Well, let's give him a gate signal off the keyboard because a lot of the time what you want to happen is to have the tempo of the session used for your phase speed, but then when it actually starts, you want to reset it and move it around. So now, anytime I re-trigger on the keyboard, and maybe this is a good moment to say, oh, I'm just going to select my device. He's monophonic and he's called polygrid, that's weird. Um, okay. Maybe I want more voices. <laughs> Did I mention it? We are currently in public beta. So. too funny it feels cheap to call these interface in issues sometimes because I mean it's once the visual on the screen is actually helping to tell you what you just did sonically you just move faster <laughs> when it can give you that feedback it's just nice yeah 
why not? So, polyphony's fun. I'm gonna turn it back off for a minute. Back to mono for a minute. Now, this is where, okay, now we understand phase, we understand what it's doing, we understand the range it's in, so why does something need to be have a purple output that's specifically for phase. It just needs to be zero to one. And the fun thing about phase is that you can, you can mess it up pretty well and it'll just wrap it back into range. So maybe an LFO would be a decent way to drive phase. <laughs> okay, let's go back to that we are the daw thing. So now we're synced to bars again, although it's not this one like earlier, right? It's exactly what we were doing a minute ago, but now I've got a knob where I can say, well, maybe this. Or maybe I like a slightly different curve in the middle. Bigwig has always had this idea, well, since version 2, called modulators, that sometimes our instruments don't have LFOs because sometimes you don't want LFOs and sometimes you want 15 and you can do it either way. Um, all of the grid devices that are doing these nice control signals also have a modulator output because there's not always an input for everything you might want to control on the module. It's just not practical to have like 17 inputs on the oscillator for every different parameter. So if something is only on the front face of one of these modules, if I click the little modulation routing button, whether it's on the AR envelope here, everything that just got colored is now clickable and modulatable. Yes, everything. Okay. So, <clears throat> just some of these general ideas on phase, and I'll just say a brief, a brief word on Obviously, where phase ends up going, if you want it to, is into the audio domain. Uh, like I said, we talked last year at great length, available on video somewhere online, about, um, about phase modulation, which is the equivalent of linear frequency modulation or FM modulation. Um, the nice thing about it, and maybe this guy just needs to get deactivated. So much more peaceful again. <laughs> So we do have these phase inputs on oscillators as well. So there is an entirely separate purpose of using it as an audio signal. So if I went ahead and say, hey, I would really like a second sine wave, and please connect it to a reasonable place. <coughs> oh, okay, then it's gonna be for phase input. What's going on here? Don't need you. So if I open that attenuator, oscillator one, well, let's say it the right way. The carrier is now being modulated this amount by the modulator oscillator. Of course, what usually makes that interesting is changing its level over time, like, uh, same as FM. The, the result is the exact same, or a very <laughs> generally unnoticeably different from FM. So let's just do a very slow attack time, maybe curve it down a little bit, so that the modulation will grow as we... You can see that little dot of where our current position is.
Yeah, maybe he needs to come over here a little too. So there is that whole other world of thinking about phase modulation as a source, and there's an equal value in that. So a lot of our devices have phase input. We've put a lot of thought into this and how it should interact. Um, because again, it's not typically how things are working. It's not usually the, oh, next step, next step, next step. If you want to do that version of the world, that's still how my brain thinks half of the time. Uh, sure. Why don't you just take a counter module that every single time you give it some kind of logic input out of eight. Uh, well, let me just click here. One little pulse that'll increment to the next step in a relative phase cycle. So yeah, I mean, as long as you can think both ways, we're defaulting to the one with a high level of accuracy. So. That's a bit of an exploration on concepts of phase in general. Um, and then the one other I'd throw in here is just the idea of non-audio filtering, right? Because we're talking about how do you use modules in a way or that you can understand them and then repurpose them all together. So I'll start, I'll start with the simplest classic example. I mean, what is a filter, right? If I throw in a sawtooth for a second, and I'm gonna go over into my filter category and drop a low pass to the output. Uh, the charming part is, I, I'm not sure we even need to listen to it. Let's just bring it down here somewhere. Okay. So, take a look at its signal. <coughs> Let's do it the other way. Let's be a little more readable. So again, we're not, that's not what we're hearing right now. We are simply looking at it. Everyone knows the low pass filter. What does it do? It gets rid of the highs, gradually. Yes, true. So if it's open all the way, the incoming signal in red is pretty much lined up with the outgoing signal in turquoise. Now, if I bring the filter cutoff down, what you see visually, it's just slowing the signal down. It's saying, no, don't go all the way to that next value you've received. Go part of the way to the next value and just integrate along the way. So if we bring this cutoff down, all we're really doing is slowing the signal to begin with. Um, a filter is already doing this out of the box. So in a very similar way, if we're thinking about non-traditional ways Of using sounds, maybe I'm gonna go ahead, turn off keyboard tracking, just like phase a minute ago. If we insert the signal, then we can manipulate it. Okay. So, what would you expect if I threw a low pass filter the upper there? portamento because all it's doing is taking the signal coming in and slowing it down now all of these things are related do you necessarily want to put something that you're setting cut off and frequency in to, to say oh what's the timing of my glide uh, maybe not so uh, another whole way to switch out modules if we were to right click on here different kinds of related modules will appear yes there are some filters but oh also an averager or a lag module okay Lag might be the better way to set portamento most of the Of course, once you're here, once you're in this range, in this environment, it's fully at your control. You want it faster on higher pitches, slower on lower pitches? Yeah, no problem. That is not a difficult thing to do. So just in terms of one non-audio filtering example, this is one that I would look at. Now, let's look at a different one altogether. I, I said we'd look at uh, some of the pitch category a little bit. I've got this attenuator all the way open. 
because I was connecting manually the pitch signal, and it needs to land on exactly those right notes to actually be the right pitch. Otherwise, it's going to be a little sharp, a little flat, a little, well, everything's going to be too close together, most likely. So if I were to throw an LFO itself in here and move it over, let's keep it color coordinated. There we go. So that's what happens when you control the full signal width of pitch, 10, 10 octaves plus or minus. With an LFO signal going through. Now, the pitch category is here to help. It's here to think specifically in pitch terms. So if I were to take a pitch quantizer and drop it on there, different way of non-audio filtering. Now I'm saying this is truly quantizing. It's saying there are particular steps I want to land on and not all of them. Now the range is a little bit crazy. <laughs> so most of the time, right? Oh, the attenuator, the range is too big. Wait a minute, remember what I just said about pitches are, need to land in pretty particular places? That might, that's not the same. It's not rock and roll. Okay. Ah, pitch scaler. I've got a unipolar signal coming in, and now I can define in nice pitch units exactly what I would want the start and stop. What, is, what should zero be equal to? What should one be equal to? Scale it in these terms and let me just think about how it should sound. Um, similarly and charmingly, there is an inspector parameter with this guy. Uniform or nearest. Right now, I've selected three notes. See? You could pick whichever ones you think are good. So if it's only three like this, right now it is doing a uniform distribution. One third of the time I'm playing this note, that note, the other, doesn't matter their spacing. Well, sometimes, again, irregular rhythms, just play the nearest note. So don't be 33%, just stay there until you get to the next guy. Compared to. So, there are definitely some... <laughs> so there are definitely some different considerations in there, and ways to deal with... How am I thinking about... What does filtering mean? If you think about what it means and how it should actually function, then you're free to use these ideas in different places and in totally different ways. Could you use the pitch quantizer for non-pitch purposes? Sure. Maybe you just want one of these irregular patterns in a different shape. I can't imagine what you want to do, so please go do it. Um, so those are some of the concepts I wanted to look at. There's, I'd be happy to end with two or three short examples. Um, so we can take a glance real quick. Let me pull up one that is actually a preset in here already. Uh, this guy? This guy! Okay. Because it's a little similar to things we were just talking about, so let's just take a glance for a minute. So now we're getting to a place where we've got some technology, we've got some ideas, let's just combine them simply and make something musical. 
Um, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I, of this entire patch, I care about these six modules. <laughs> the rest is whatever you want to put in there. So what's happened? Ooh, what is happening over in this area? Well, this is a very interesting module that tells you how many notes are currently held down at the current time. So if you've got this feed that gives you information like that, you can do some interesting things with it. So, um, speaking musically for a moment, if I play one note, you can even see it here in the shape. It's a minor third, basically. Now the problem is, if I want this patch to be polyphonic, and I start playing a bunch of different, uh, oh, let's just do it. If I start playing, they're not all gonna stack very well with minor thirds on top of them. Uh, ah, it feels out, like all the scales are kind of jumping on top of itself. So, we've got modulation signals, right? We saw modulators earlier. This guy, at the Wii end of I.O., lets you take any signal in your system, use it as a modulator to control other devices. So, let's just take a look for one brief moment. How many keys are being held? Is that greater than one? If I'm playing more than one note, change my harmony because it won't sit on top of itself anymore. So this nice little modulator here, if I mouse over it, is basically saying, hey, turn off the minor third, it's a slightly darker shade, and it's a little funny in here, and turn on the fifth instead because those stack quite well. I can still go back to one note and have that effect. Hey! It's just this connection of taking a technology idea, understanding the different parts in play, and then saying, okay, but what's the actual impact I want it to have? How do I want it to work? Again, the rest of the patch, I mean, take this part, swap it out with something else. Or maybe I just want to try something totally different altogether. Let's, uh, haha. -huh. It's easy enough to switch these things around. <laughs> Maybe you want to try fourths instead of fifths and try your luck. <laughs> or both. Might work, a little more risky, but... Buyer beware, I leave that part up to you. Um, let's just look at one more example then. I want to make something simple. Something that I was asked uh, by a friend about the other day, which is, hey, your, your envelopes don't loop. They don't have a looping setting on the current envelopes that are in there. And the unfortunate answer in, in a modular system is, well, it does if you make it loop. So <laughs> let's just walk through the logic for a couple seconds. I'm going to go ahead and take, uh, let's switch to an AD envelope generator. Just attack decay. So if I want this to loop, how do I want it to work? I'm going to think a little bit mathy for a second. OK, when it gets to the end of its cycle, then I want it to re-trigger if I'm still holding a note. Okay, that's not bad. How do I tell if it's gone to the end of its cycle? Well, that's the only place where the output value should be zero. We've been looking at these oscilloscopes of different shapes and sizes the whole time. Uh, once you start getting into comparators and stuff, uh, you're trying to find particular numbers. 
I would say there is also a value readout module to see actual signals in different domains as necessary. So yeah, it's definitely ending at zero. So, okay, let's, let's go nuts for a second. If that signal is equal to zero, uh, and I'm still holding the note down. The joy of logical comparators is if you think of it in language terms, and is exactly the right concept. <laughs> So as long as it just ended and that note is still being held down, how do I tell where notes are held down? Well, I've got a gate input over here. Okay. And I can even see directly on the face plate, but we can just make it big. Okay. Note's still being held down. It, they're both true. I let go of one of them. Oh, it's not true anymore. Okay. Cool. That seems about right. Another common request is to have feedback signals in here, to be able to route outputs back to inputs somewhere along the chain, not to the same module necessarily. Uh, and there is a way to do that, and that is to insert the long delay module. So put some delay, even if it's short, to break the chain and let feedback be possible. Okay. Because now I need to insert this output to say, oh, but then trigger the input again. Okay. I'm going to think ahead. I probably, this is AD. It doesn't matter how long my triggers are, so it's going to be a lot easier to deal with if I say, give me a nice short gate pulse, like a very short gate signal. If I were to insert that exact same thing over here, I mean, if you just look at it, it's quite literally, oh, a note came in and I gave you the tiniest burst possible. Boom, on off, on off. Because now I need both of these ideas to go to that import. So let's play a game for a minute. We've got both of those. If either of them are true, we want to trigger it. So this or that. Mm -hmm. Ah, but I want the full signal over there because I need to know if the key is still being held down. I know I should probably stand here and now perform with this simple boring patch for 10 minutes, but um, just another example of what's in here. So again, the idea is whatever environment you're in, there are concepts that are consistent. How they're implemented, I mean, like we're doing phase a little bit more extremely into our things, makes different things possible or not, but the ideas are the same. And if you can understand what the fundamental functions of different modules are, you can reuse them in totally different and maybe unintended ways, yeah. That's all. Just want to talk about modular stuff. Thanks for coming. If uh, you want to.